Hey ladies, we are so thankful that you are here. It is already the month of February and we have an awesome treat for you this evening. Pastor Melody and I are gonna be sitting down and talking about the value that God places on relationships among believers. You know, all throughout scripture, we use terminology like brother and sister and it's not just by chance that God uses those words to describe our relationships with each other. It's because he places such an importance and such value on the relationships between his children. And so tonight we wanna to explore that. We wanna talk about what it looks like to be in relationship with our, with our sisters and with our brothers in Christ. And so I hope that you have been preparing your heart. I hope that you've been preparing your home. I hope that you have made room for the Lord to move this evening, that our hearts have been, that we allow God to till the soil of our hearts so that when he throws seed, it will it will, it will plant and produce beautiful fruit. As always, we have volunteers who are here with you this evening to pray for you. If at any point during this evening's message, you would like somebody to pray with you or for you, please do not hesitate to click the request prayer button. It's as simple as clicking that button and we will pull you along with one of our incredible prayer partners and we will take you to the Father and we will go with you on your behalf to seek the Lord for you and for whatever the situation is in your life. And we want to hear from you. Last month, we had people from all over the place watching and tuning in and worshiping with us. And we wanna know where you're watching from. So make sure you drop a comment letting us know where you're watching from, what you're excited to hear about this evening. And in honor of Valentine's Day, I wanna encourage you to drop a comment telling us what you love most about the character of God. Like, what is it that when you think about this thing about God, it causes your heart to flutter? It causes your heart to race when you think about this particular characteristic about the God that we serve. I wanna hear from you. I wanna know what that is. So please share that with us in the comments so that we can honor the Lord and rejoice with you tonight. And with that being said, no further ado, let's get ready to worship. Hey, welcome everyone. Are you ready to worship tonight? All right. And uh, these songs really just kind of like prayers. And uh, why don't you stand with us if you're in the room or if you're at home. Uh, if you're meeting at a home, just make this place, make that place your sanctuary. Just set your heart and mind to the Lord. I just want you to close your eyes. Lord, we just invite you here. We invite you into our hearts. Do what you want Cause you can have it all Let's sing There's nothing worth more Will ever come close Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, I sing. I've tasted and seen. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone Your presence, Lord There's 
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place, fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord.
Sing this with me. And he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. It all starts there, doesn't it? He loves us. me, make it personal, yes, he loves me, oh, how he loves me, oh, how he loves me, oh, how he loves me, yes, you're his great treasure, yes, he loves me.
to be overcome by your presence, Lord. I want to sing that one more time. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come fly so this heart, place. Right? in this time just to love on our Father. God, I'm aware there is pain. Under the sound of my voice, there is pain. There is trauma. Healing is needed. Deliverance is needed. Restoration is needed. And just a reprieve. For some, they just need to be able to come up for air. And I'm thankful there is a time of refreshing coming and sweeping across what I believe is coming to this remnant that seek you, they find you. That when we say, Abba, come, Holy Spirit, come, that you're as close as the mention of your name. And so we receive that. Would you just lift your hands and just receive the love of God tonight? It's a gift that has to be received has to be accepted and received. And so, Father, I just pray the peace of God. Just blanket your girls. Just cover us right now. We welcome the Holy Spirit to do what we cannot. We gather under the name of Jesus. We break bread. We open our hearts. We open our hands, Jesus, to offer you the little bit that we have, the little bit of strength maybe our small home, our small conversation, our timid words shared and insecurity. It's not much, but Jesus, we offer you what we have. And we thank you that our little with your much, God, leaves us overflowing, overwhelmed by your love, overjoyed with grateful hearts so thankful to be in this place. We're so thankful to be in this place. You know, it's funny because this morning I was looking at you version, and I don't know if you happen to check the verse of the day, if I can get my phone to unlock here, but the verse of the day today I thought was pretty um, significant. It's for where two or three gather in my name, I am among them, and I just thought that, that was beautiful especially in light of what we'll talk about tonight, but as we gather in homes, and I know that many of you right now that you're gathering in homes, and maybe there's just two of you there, and I'm going to tell you that I almost didn't make it here tonight. Um, I don't know if uh, any of you may have gotten, if you're in, if you're local in the Beckley area, we rarely have much traffic and compared to big cities, and, but we waited for an hour to inch past two miles and so I was coming in on two wheels we were making plans of how do we do the message via FaceTime or Zoom if I can't get here um, and I had total peace and I was just kind of giggling because one of the things that I think 2020 should have taught all of us is um, that we don't need as much as we thought we need to have church can I get an amen that all we really need is the Holy Spirit right we need the presence of Jesus and he promises us where two or three are gathered, I'm in their midst. And so I backed up just a little bit, and I want to share this with you to empower you tonight. Um, 
The context of that verse is in Matthew 18, and it says this, Jesus is talking, he says, I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything that you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together in my name, I am among them. And I think sometimes when we have these passages memorized, it's easy to glance over this and not realize how empowering this really is, how empowering this is for your situations as you gather. But notice he says, whatever you forbid on earth is going to be forbidden in heaven. This is a spiritual supernatural law. Whatever you allow on earth will be allowed in heaven. This means right now we have the choice and decision to allow distraction on earth. Come on. We can allow fear and insecurity we can allow things to block or hinder our ability. The Holy Spirit is coming. He wants to come without measure. He's as close as the mention of his name. He's saying where two or three are gathered, I'm among you. He's promised this. This is not Holy Spirit, please come and we wonder if he'll show up today. This is we know where two or three are gathered. This means he is in the room with us right as we speak. The spirit of the living God is here. And so the empowerment is whatever we allow on earth will be allowed in heaven. Whatever we forbid on earth, we forbid you insecurity or fear. Do you hear me? We, we forbid distraction here on earth. And when we do that, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit that he opens up the heavens and rains down on us. And where two or three agree, if two of you agree on something in prayer, when we close this service, I challenge you, don't close these services in your home without agreeing with a sister in prayer over your needs. He says he will hear it. Do you understand the empowerment that we have? We don't need as much as we think we need to have church. And so I hope that you are ready because we have all that we need, just two or three gathered in the name of Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. He's promised that if we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. And so we're going to come into his presence, but can we just dedicate our hearts just for a minute? Just lift up your hands and tell him, say, God, help to clear my mind. God, just free me of distractions of self. Help me not to be self-aware. Help me to be God-aware. Father, if there are veils over my eyes, deception over my eyes, I pray that they would fall. Father, speak to my heart. Father, loose the Spirit of God and the Word of God, the rhema Word of God into my heart. Father, I give you the questions that are on my mind. And I trust that you will answer these questions by your wisdom through your word. That you promise to give any wisdom who asks. And so I ask you, God, answer the questions in my heart. You see my need and my lack. And I bring it to you and I set it in your feet. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. We believe you and we trust you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen. Are you excited to be here tonight? Excited to be in your homes tonight? I hope that you guys are um, brought some potluck things in your home and you're prepared to enjoy um, some yummy food. And if you need to take a quick bathroom break, don't let it be too long. We just have a, do have a really important announcement for all of our hosts and co-hosts of groups. Um, and so we'll be right back after we check out this video and we're gonna dive into the word. Hey Arise, I'm so excited to gather tonight and I actually have a special message just for all of those of you who right now you're opening your home to allow other women in to share and break bread and pray with one another. I just want to thank you, all of our co-hosts and hosts. I know that it's a lot easier just to attend, just to come to church, but you've embraced the vision to grow smaller. And I can't tell you how just thankful and proud of you I am. I know many of you have never done anything like this before and you've taken a step of faith 
and just invited someone over. And I have to encourage you that what you are doing might seem insignificant to you, but actually it is the most beautiful expression, the most simple, original expression of Christianity. You are actually helping us to further and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's such a big deal how you are inviting Christ and others into your home that I would like to come alongside and provide a special weekend just of ministry for you. And so the last weekend in July of this year, we're gonna devote this weekend to our Arise hosts and co-hosts. So this is for any of you that have opened your home to invite women in or you see yourself continuing to do this. We wanna take a weekend where we just pour into you and just gather around and support the gospel efforts that you are partnering with us to do. You know, if you are whole, you're gonna to continue to provide healing to others. And so I wanna extend this offer that this is gonna be a completely free weekend where you can come and you can gather. It's gonna be a Friday night and some time during Saturday. And we're even gonna fly in some of our Arise hosts from around the world. I know my friend Elisa from Israel will be coming in. I know our one of our hosts from Hawaii will be here. You'll get to hear what God is doing around the globe in global Arise gatherings. It's gonna be an unforgettable weekend. So you don't have to pay for it, but you do need to register so we can get a heads up. So be sure that you go on the site and register um, that you are going to join us for that Arise host and co-host weekend. It's gonna be such a sweet time. We get to know each other, encourage each other, and heal together in the name of Jesus. Can't wait to see you there. All right, well, we're excited to be here tonight, and um, this is an exciting Arise gathering because I get to introduce you formally. I know many of you have seen Kayla um, as she has led through since Arise Conference Weekend, and Kayla is our online women's pastor, and she really helps me pastor the ladies that open their homes up each week, um, each month um, to host Arise gatherings. And so, Kayla, why don't you introduce yourself? Can you, let me make sure that you, are you on? Nope, she's not on. All right, let's say that, you should say her joke again. Yes, I'm <laughs> the oldest of six, so normally I can talk loud enough so people can hear me even without a microphone. But um, I was thinking about this earlier about how um, it's a preacher and a politician walking into a sanctuary, and I thought, it's the start of a really bad joke. And so, so why don't but, you give just a little bit of background with that? So what do you mean by that? Because not everyone knows your story. Sure. So I actually um, represent this area in, this, in the House of Delegates. The Lord opened the door for me to run in 2014. And I, to be honest, I really didn't even think I was going to win. Um, but God had other plans for me. And so I've had the incredible honor of, of representing uh, this area and, and ultimately Jesus in the House of Delegates for the last this is my seventh year. I literally became a woman in the House of Delegates. <laughs> and so how old were you when you first got elected? 21. 21 years old. So, yes, brave. A lot. It takes a lot of courage. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I'm so excited to have Kayla. Kayla and I have, um, we're sort of, sort, we call us sword sisters, and we are cut from the same cloth. And um, I really felt this need to bring someone in that would help me um, uh pastor online as we headed into conference this year in an avenue that we've never really taken on before. And so I wanted her, as she continues to function in that role, to come and help me cast vision this year. Um, so 2021, again, we're on the, you know, we're kind of recovering and reeling from 2020. And um, I don't, I was telling another pastor today, Kayla, I don't believe that we're going to truly understand the impact and the effects of 2020 for years to come. Like I'm talking about mentally, emotionally, spiritually, um, that a lot has happened, a lot has damaged people in many different ways, and we're gonna kind of see the ramifications. And so we definitely wanna come into this year um, casting vision. And so I'm gonna share just for a few minutes on um, the vision of where we're going as an Arise uh, ministry, women's ministry in our homes and in our campuses, um, and how that relates to you. But we're also gonna sort of answer this question of of um, Christian loneliness. Does anybody ever, do you know immediately like what I mean when I say Christian loneliness? If that's you, like raise your hand. Anyone, I, I asked the question on my Instagram stories today, have you ever felt alone in a room full of people? And I think it was close to 100% of people answered yes, that we, there, and there's a reason that you can walk into a room. I am an extrovert on the high end of extroverts. Like it takes a lot for me to meet a stranger. I don't mind, you know, putting myself out there and meeting people. 
But even I, the greatest of extroverts, one of the high extroverts, I will walk into a room. If there's more than about 20 people there that I don't know, especially if they already know each other, even I will sort of clam up and kind of recoil, and it's uncomfortable for me. And so it can, it can be this thing in churches and this environment that we create. How many of you remember, you were around, if those of you in the room, you were around um, Arise when um, I started casting vision for growing smaller. Raise your hand. Now, this was pre-COVID. So this was 2019. I had already started to feel like God had given me a vision for Arise Women's Ministry. And honestly, that hasn't changed. It's pretty neat to watch how God prepares us for things that are coming, and we don't even realize that this is what he's doing. And so really, our vision has not changed. Actually, I believe God is using COVID to make us, to force us into embracing this grow smaller kind of vision. Um, and so as I cast this, we're going to answer this question of biblically, why do so many Christian women specifically struggle, even if they come to church regularly, why do they struggle so much with loneliness? Why, can, why do we sit in a room full of people and we praise the Lord, and maybe we come to the altar and cry, but really in our week to week, we feel this sense of emptiness or loss of purpose or like we don't really have a gift. And so we're going to talk about some of that um, simultaneously while we, while we answer the question of where is Arise going post-COVID? What does a, a, a post-COVID Arise gathering look like? And so before we get into this, I want to recap what our vision has been as a, a women's ministry since 2019. Um, it has been to see women um, saved, healed, and empowered. How many of you remember that? Let's casting vision, saved, healed, and empowered. And this just cutely afterwards, I didn't even notice this until like months later, that it actually is the acronym for she. And so it's just like the Holy Ghost to do that, right? Um, so we want to see women saved, healed, and empowered. And really the vision, all of our messages for Arise really fall into these categories, but we've focused a lot on the salvation part, and the healing part. How many of you remember the triggered series and the breakdown or breakthrough series? We're talking about mental health, getting you healed. But really what I envision this year focusing on is that third part, that empowerment. And so we'll always talk about salvation. We'll always talk about healing. Um, but really I want to see women empowered in the calling that God has for them. Um, in 1 Corinthians 4, this is Paul talking to Timothy. I'm sorry, Paul talking to the Corinthians, and he says this. For even if you were to have 10,000 teachers to guide you in Christ, you wouldn't have many fathers who led you to Christ, and listen to this, and assumed responsibility for you. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the good news of salvation. And I, and I told Kayla, this is truly the desire of my heart. I think there are many people in the body of Christ that are willing to be teachers, but not very many people in the body of Christ that are willing to be mothers and fathers. And what the body of Christ needs at this moment is mothers to mother people, not just teachers. You see, I love teachers, and I'm thankful for teachers. Um, matter of fact, my cousin Carrie here, she is my daughter, my preschool daughter's um, teacher. And the, 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 it's wonderful, and I'm so thankful for teachers. But teachers get to send the kids home, right? Like, they don't have to assume personal, uh, permanent responsibility. Uh, the role of a mother is different than the role of a teacher. And so my, my burden has been that I don't want to just give you information be a motivational speaker, um, teach even just teach you the Bible, the goal would be to watch you grow in maturity. And I have to assume some responsibility for your growth. So I'm asking myself the past several years some really hard questions, like am I doing this well? Are, are the women in our church really growing? Or do we treat church like the movie theater? Is it something that we come to sit and listen, oh, that was really good, maybe eat some chocolate, or drink some coffee and then leave. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so my goal is not to be a teacher. It really is to mother you. So I'm going to bring the women of this women's ministry who feel called to this women's ministry. I, my goal is to push you out of the nest to empower you. Um, and can I just give you like a disclaimer? Some of you are not going to like this, okay? Um, and so, but this is a mom's job is to get the kid, you know, like there's a time when the child doesn't want to grow up. They don't want to go to school. They don't want to feed them, feed themselves. They want you to feed them, you know, like, and the, a good mother realizes, okay, it's no longer healthy for you to stay at this point. 
And so this is really my heart. And if I had to, and I told you this when I casted vision in 2019, if we had to dismantle a working system, we're packing out 500 women you know, on a Wednesday night with no childcare. And I, I told you, I, I may, it may be insane, but I'm dismantling this to grow smaller because I realize we're growing in number, but I'm not seeing a growth in empowerment and maturity in the body of Christ. I still sense that something is missing. And so I have to motivate you to maturity and not just, and sometimes that makes that means making you uncomfortable. Now, last month we talked about God's progressive work in our in our life. Remember Pastor Maria's message? It's a process. It's so good, ladies. If you missed that message, I challenge you to go back and listen to it. But I want to remind you that God's progressive work in your life demonstrates that there's a logical, deliberate end goal in mind. Um, and so God is taking you somewhere that this is all for a purpose, that when God sees you like that Ikea kitchen, remember that Pastor Mary, Mary Tosh, that was an amazing um, analogy, that the end goal, he is taking you somewhere. And we see this on humanity, that when God came and he created the earth, he didn't just like randomly, arbitrarily design things. He had an intent for you and I from the very beginning. Um, and I love, I'm a creative in nature. I run the creative department here at the church. And so I love creativity. And so when I read the story of creation, I'm reading it as a creative. And I love that God is a progressive tinkerer. If you notice, like in the day one, Kayla, where it says that he made this, and then he said, hmm, it's good. And he went to sleep, you know, like and he stopped for a minute. And then the next day he does something else like, hmm, it's good. And so he's a progressive tinkerer. And this is what the Lord does in our lives. I'm thankful that the Lord doesn't try to fix me from a heathen to the apostle Paul overnight, right? Like he's not downloading that entire plan. He's a progressive, he progressively tinkers in my life to move me toward the goal of sanctification. Um, and so we see this though, that he has a vision in mind. And so I want us to ask ourselves this question as we, as we're talking about Arise's vision, really I want it to align with God's vision. What did, what was God's vision in the beginning? Like what did he want when he created the earth? Like, we just bought a house. We close on it tomorrow, and it's a very 70s house. Like, it's very 70s, which I'm kind of okay with because I'm quirky. But um, we're going to do some renos. But my kids walk in, and they're like, Mom, why would we get this house? Like, it's, like, our kitchen's already, like, done. And it's updated. And this way. And I'm like, can't you see what I see? Like, can't, can't you see what I see, what this is going to be? And this is how the Lord views you and I. That he comes to us, and this is how he viewed when he started, when he created the earth, he had a vision in mind. So what was his vision? What did he envision? Um, in Genesis 1, 27 through 28, it says, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And notice, after he makes man and he gives man a job to do, then he doesn't say, It is good, it is good, it is good. Then God looked over all he made, and then he changes it. He said, This is very good. So when God finished making man and empowering man, he said, it is very good. So I'm going to give you a, a two things that we noticed from this story, and then I'm going to tag Kayla and just really let her share why I'm bringing this creation story up to you. So the first thing I want you to notice from this, though, with what, what is God envisioning for humanity, for you and I, uh, I want you to notice that God did not rest until he had empowered man to partner with him in the vision for earth. That he didn't stop until not just he had created things, but he went one step further. He didn't just create Adam and Eve. He, he gave them a commissioning. He gave them a job to do. God could have created the earth it fully tended, the animals pre-named. Come on. Like he could have fully, everything was already done, but he didn't. He said he could have created all of, why didn't God just create the earth exactly as he wanted? The garden already tended, the animals already named, and already populated. Why? Because he wants to partner with us. He wants to bring us along and let us have a partnership in what he is envisioning. But so he, and we see this echoed again. So this is not only this command to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, and take dominion over it. This was the first command given to humanity. But it was given again, even after the flood, when God wipes out the world, and then he starts over. He tells Noah the exact same thing. He says, leave the boat, all of you, your wife, sons, and their wives. Release the animals, the livestock, the small animals that scurry along the ground so they can be fruitful and what can you say this word multiply come on say it in your home say it multiply 
throughout the earth. Now, I want to look at these words really, really fast. I won't stay there long, but in Hebrew, this word fruitful, to be fruitful, means to branch off and to bear fruit. It doesn't mean to stay where we are in our comfortable place and huddle together with those who we're, com- we're comfortable with, but it means to branch off and to bear fruit. The word multiply means to become many in number, numerous, increase, enlarge, become many. To fill the earth means to replenish, to be full. To subdue it means to govern it and bring it under subjection. To take dominion means to rule, reign, and prevail. Notice in Genesis it says the Lord placed the man in the garden to tend and watch over it. He gave us work to to do. God intended on man to bring heaven to earth. God intended on us to scatter and to fill the earth and take dominion over it. Now, the next thing I want you to notice about this is that nearly everything God created either pro- reproduces or sustains and a- aids reproduction. There was not a single thing that God created in creation that either doesn't have the power to reproduce within it or that's not for the purpose of continuing and aiding and sustaining reproduction. It said that all of the trees and the plants had the seeds of seeds bearing inside of them. And I want you to think about this crazy concept that every single seed for everything that we see now was created then in that first week. That inside that those plants, animals, and humans were the seeds necessary to sustain. God didn't have to create, recreate a, a, a new life from nothing, not once. That everything that we even see now until the end of the earth, when the earth will pass away, was made originally in the garden. That's amazing. Scientifically, it is impossible for man to create life from non-life. We can reproduce life from life, with, but we cannot take no life and create life out of it. And yet every single one of us and every animal and every living thing has the power to reproduce with inside of us. This is wild. Even the moon controlling the seasons and the tides, do you understand? Everything was about aiding reproduction. And this is an eternal law. And the Bible says in Genesis, as long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest. And in Matthew, I want you to see Jesus' commission and this parallel with this God commission in Genesis to be fruitful and multiply. Because what I'm not just telling you is very, not saying like literally, okay, all of you on the count of three, we're going to go have more babies. Like that's not what I'm trying to, not where I'm trying to lead you. But I want you to see this parallel of how God calls us to go fill the earth, to scatter and to fill the earth and to rule it and to bring heaven into our sphere, to bring Eden into our sphere to rule and reign with our unique giftings and to multiply. In Matthew 28, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so you see this clear Genesis parallel where he says, listen, I've given you all the fruits that you need, all the plants. Go and take dominion. And now you see Jesus echoing this spiritually and saying, go and go from Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. He says, go and scatter and multiply and take dominion over the earth. And so this is, this is the commands in the garden. Um, and the last thing, and I'm going to have Kayla really dive into this and spend the next few minutes really talking about this was there was one thing though in the creation story that God said was not good only one thing that were very, this is good this is good this is very good so Kayla why don't you tell us what was not good and why sure you know you as you were talking I was just thinking about this pattern of it is good statements how six times in Genesis chapter one God says it is good and on the seventh time he says it is very good and so when you fast forward to chapter two verse 18 you see this line that says and God said it is not good now how many of you are like me and you when you read a line and it says and God said you like want to really lean in because you're like if God's saying something it's something I need to listen to and it says God said it is not good it is not good for what it is not good for man to be alone. And so literally we see this picture from the very beginning of creation where God has deposited inside, the, inside of humanity this belonging in a group, this belonging for relationship, that he has created us not only for partnership with him and his children, but for relationship and partnership among his children. And it's so, you, you know, even I was talking to Melody about this earlier. It's, you know, God says he created mankind in his image. But if you go back to even prior to creation, even before creation started, there was a relationship present. 
with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity, three in one. There was this relationship that existed before creation even started. And so when God says he created us in his image, he created us for relationship. And what's so cool about that is over the course of the last year, we've been able to really experience what happens when we are isolated and the pain and the suffering and the loneliness that we all endure when we are isolated from others. We were never created to be independent people. And you brought up the parallels from creation in the New Testament. And and I love how you can pick up a thread at the beginning of the Bible and pull it all the way to the end. And, it, and it, it's, it's the same vision in the creation story as it is in the gospels and as it is today where God wants us to be in relationship with each other. And Jesus, if you really think about it, Jesus did not entrust his ministry, you know, after his death, resurrection and his ascension, he didn't entrust his ministry to a bunch of independent individual Christians. He entrusted his ministry to the family of God. You know, I mentioned this in the intro. He uses language like brother and sister, not flippantly. He does it intentionally because he believes in the value of relationship, not only between him and his children, but in the relationship among his children. And you were talking about reproduction. What's so cool is when God says something isn't good, he doesn't just say it's not good and then let you figure it out on your own. He actually solves the problem for humanity. He says, it's not good for man to be alone. What does he do? He creates a counterpart for humanity. He doesn't leave Adam alone to take dominion and to subdue and to reproduce on his own. He gives him a partner to do that with. And so literally from the beginning of time, God has had this clear vision of relationship. And I love that your vision for Arise takes that into consideration to create the sisterhood among God's daughters. So what, one of the things that I want you to understand is we're going to talk a little bit about this parallels of creation and um, the garden and how that relates to our lives. And so when I, um, a, about two years ago, I got the privilege of a bucket list item. I got to go see the giant sequoias, the redwood sequoias. In, um, and so I think we have some pictures of those uh, we can put up. So let's go to the, the next picture real quick. Um, so this is me standing inside of one of these gigantic trees. These are some of the largest living um, organisms on the planet. You can go to the next one. This is me and my friend. Like there was no even getting a picture of uh, this whole tree because it's so large. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure this might be illegal, but I took this. Um, this is a pine cone. What um, happens at a rise stays at a rise. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a pine cone from that. And I was just, like, I'm just amazed at these trees. And they're some of the, again, some of the oldest living organisms on the planet. And wh- what's interesting about these trees is that when storms and when floods would come in and wipe out everything, or even forest fires would wipe out everything. These trees have stood for literally thousands of years. They have endured. And so you would think that a tree that's 350 feet high would have to have some massively deep roots, right? Wouldn't we assume that these would have deep roots? But actually, um, they don't. They only go about five to six feet underground, but they go horizontal. And so they intertwine. These kind of trees only exist with other trees in groups. They only can live in tribes or communities. And so this is what happens under the ground. And go back to that first picture one more time. And so this is what happens is under the ground, their roots actually intertwine under the ground. And so they're, they're drawing strength from the other trees in the tribe of trees. And this is why, and so actually you can see whole acreages of these root systems underneath the ground where it's not even very deep. They're just so intertwined with one another. And so when these storms come and when these floods come and when these fires, that they draw strength from one another underground. And really, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a system where no one is isolated because let me tell you, there will be a fire that will come in your life. There will be a storm that will come in your life. And if you have isolated yourself, if you don't have that underneath root system developed, then you may not make it. The things that endure are the, through these hardships and through these hard times are things that are connected in community. You know, it's really interesting. I I love that you brought up the sequoias because I love how God uses nature to even cast his vision for humanity. Like even as you were saying that, I was thinking about um, how very few animals travel as individuals. 
Most animals even live in packs. They, they go in flocks. They go in herds. Um, even, like, you never see one blade of grass. Like, you never see just one. You see thousands. You never see just one flower on its own. You see so many. And so it's beautiful how God casts this vision of where two or more are gathered, um, even in his creation, for us to see and reflect on. And it reminds me a lot, like, did, did you ever play the game Red Rover, like, when you were younger? Yes, like, amazing, Red Rover, yeah. Red Rover, send Melody right over. Yes, like, it was amazing. my favorite game. Like, I would really like to compete against you because I, I would take I feel, you down. We should have done this as like an icebreaker, <laughs> like after, meet me in the parking lot. At your home groups, Red Rover, right after exactly. this. <laughs> We're picking teams, I'm just kidding. So, But it's really cool because what happens in Red Rover, if you've ever played, you split up into two teams and you lock arms, like arm in arm with your team. And what you do is you call the opposing team, your enemy, to come at you. And if you were standing by yourself, like if I were standing here and Melody did just like run at me, like she would knock me over so quick. But when I lock arms with Carrie, when I lock arms with Vicky, we're able to defeat Melody. We're able to win the game. And so that's what I think, I just think of that, that fun game where and how how when we lock arms with each other, there's strength in numbers. The friction, the, the power that's created is I'm pulling this way and you're pulling that way to prevent the enemy from coming and, and taking yeah. taking our taking our victory. That's good. It reminds me of Ecclesiastes. It says two are better than one for they help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. And I really love just tinkering with this idea of where two or three are gathered. A two or three is, you know, is stronger than one. Um, there's something significant with this whole two or three thing. That, And so I want you, I know we show you a grove of trees, but really... Um, this idea that I have to have this tribe that's 50 strong, you know, w none of us, including the Son of God, are capable of having deep networks of 100 people that we're intimately close with. Even Jesus had a 12, and he had a 3, and he had John. And so this doesn't have to be a massive network of women that you're intimately close with, but you do need to be close and interlocking with other people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's almost like quality over quantity. Yeah. Like so many people want quantity, but in, at the end of the day, you want quality over quantity. And, you know, I was having this conversation with my sister. She's a missionary in the, Dem in the Dominican Republic. And full disclosure, like, I am not a gardener. Like I'm really bad at garden. I, I literally, everything I've ever planted has died. Like I heard orchids were easy to plant. So I got one dead. Like I can't do it. I'm just really bad at gardening. Absolutely. But my sister is excellent. She's, she has a gift for gardening. And I was talking to her one day and she brought up this concept of three sisters planting. And I don't know, has anybody ever heard of like three sisters planting? Well, it's a super cool concept where you take three different forms of vegetables. And I know I say that weird. Everybody always makes fun of me. But you take three different forms of vegetables and you plant them together. You take corn, squash, and beans and you plant them together. Now, you can plant corn by itself. You can plant squash by itself. And you can plant beans by itself. But there's something about planting these three sisters together that produce a stronger crop for each of these pieces of vegetation. And so what happens is when you plant these together in this three sisters planting, the corn as it grows, it grows in a stalk that provides stability and security for the for the beans and the squash to wrap itself around and grow. It provides strength for the other pieces of vegetation to lean on. The beans are called the giving sister, where they literally take nitrogen from the air and put it into the soil for the benefit of all three. And then what the beans do is they literally, as they grow, they wrap themselves around the corn stalk, and then they wrap themselves between the vines of the squash, holding these three pieces of, of vegetation together. And then the squash brings this incredible gift of creating leaves that are big enough that provide shade so that the, the, so that the soil can be moist to prevent weeds, and they're prickly, and so they prevent pests from coming and attacking and destroying and devouring. And what happens is when we take this concept of this three sisters planting, when we plant ourselves together, when we lock arm in arm, when our roots are entangled with each other, we are able able to achieve and accomplish so much more. We produce a stronger result. We produce a stronger, better, more desirable result when we work hand in hand 
arm in arm. It's so good. And, you know, I think about 1 Corinthians 3. It says, Paul says, I planted the seed in your heart. Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. So, again, we see this three that, that in the kingdom of God, none of us were designed to do this by ourselves, and it takes all of us. And so even, like, furthering the kingdom of God, it takes all of us. One person cannot do it. It has to be all of us planted together. Um, and so I can hear the questions in my brain. I can hear. I know what some of you are thinking. I know some of you that really struggle to find. You don't have your little tribe, and um, and you're wondering about that, that you've tried, and you don't have relationships, and so we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but this is, I want you to understand the power in community and the necessity for us to go underground, so to speak, as we hurl toward the end times, the necessity for us to create a network of rooted and grounded healthy scissors a side note, make sure that the three sister planting, that one of you ain't cray cray, right? So like you got to make sure that you don't plant yourself beside somebody who is toxic and rotting, you know, like be careful who you wrap yourself around, right? So like we're going to, you know, you have to walk with the godly. You, you really, I mean, you're going to, you're going to suck. You don't want to suck something out of them that you don't want in your marriage either. So, um, so be careful with that as a, just a total random side note. But um, we have been intentionally growing smaller because we have seen the necessity for this, especially, especially coming toward the end times, when we, according to scripture, will not always have this ability to come and sit and gather in large groups, nor do I believe that it's the most beneficial way to do discipleship and to do ministry. Um, and so, you know, tell me uh, why, why we can't get this in a big, huge, why we can't go back to just monthly gatherings where you pack out the house, everybody comes like the movies. Sure. So those are always fun. Like you yeah. always enjoy yourself, you enjoy your friends, but at the end of the day you leave and three days later, if you're like me, you're like, okay, like how do I, how do I allow this to impact the rest of my life? But, but it's very difficult for you to grow in relationship with individuals and create a community when you are in a large setting. Um, you can be in a room of a thousand, you can be in a room of a hundred and still be alone. And what happens, you know, I always think of the scripture, um, iron sharpens iron. And when I was younger, when I used to go visit my grandpa, I'd always walk in and he'd be watching sci-fi and he'd be sharpening his knife. And what he'd do is he'd have a whetstone and this knife and I can, eat, I can still hear the sound of that knife rubbing up against that whetstone. And what was happening was the edge of that knife, as he was rubbing it up against that whetstone, was getting sharper and sharper and sharper so that he would be able to gut the deer that he would kill to feed our family in a couple of months. And so as I think about that, in order for us to, for iron to sharpen iron, we have to rub up against each other. It, the, you can't just come to church on Sunday and shake hands. And if we're being honest, y'all, y'all, the church has been socially distancing since before coronavirus. We don't want to be next to each other. We don't want to be vulnerable with each other. We don't want to grow in relationship with each other. We'd rather come here, sit in our pew, pretend like, oh, I've got all these friends, but then we go home and we're alone. We have nobody to call. We have nobody to lean on. And you can't grow in these relationships. You can't build these relationships when all you're doing is coming and sitting in a pew on a Sunday morning and shaking hands. Well, and honestly, and um, honestly, I just have to say from like a, a, a a pastor's perspective, um, I sometimes feel a little bit helpless because I, I recognize the loneliness, but if I could just be really, mm, I love you, but honest, most women don't want to be vulnerable. Yeah. Like they're lonely, but they don't want their insecurities. They don't want, I try to provide formats to where women um, like I knew, because I know women, I've done women's ministry long enough, I knew when we went to roundtable discussion that the numbers of Arise gatherings would, would be cut. I knew it was going to happen, and it did happen, because women don't want someone else in their life. And so we have to own some responsibility that if we're in a community and we're not taking ownership of like maybe God, maybe I feel this loneliness, like as square footage in our homes has gone up, gone up even in our homes as we're virtual and it's easy to be virtual because we can only put what we want out there on the screen, um, that we have a, pro a social interaction problem. Our communities are not even built in the way where we sit on the front porch and we don't even know who our next door neighbors are anymore. Like we have lost our sense of community and we have to renormalize it and understand for iron to sharpen iron, that means you have to rub up against people that maybe rub up against you the wrong way. 
way. Like that it's going to bring some stuff. Your girlfriend's going to notice things in your life that you don't want her to call you out on. It's going to be messy. You're going to get in arguments. You're going to have disagreements. And that's a part of relationship. And there is no relationship context without those disagreements. But they're so necessary for true growth because we're not sharpened if we're just alone. Um, And so some of this, I think, has to be, I'm saying this in love, has to be some ownership. I know like Lisa, when she was here and she talked about being a godmother and not having a mother. I think about Maria who literally had no mother. Like her mother died during childbirth. And both of them felt like the Lord told them to be what they didn't have. And so it's easy to say, well, I've, nobody's, nobody's come to talk to me. Nobody, like, but we have to assume ownership that that's okay if like you're a brand new Christian. But if you've been in church four or five years, why aren't you looking for the lonely? Like, why aren't you inviting someone into your home? Like, at some point, we have to take ownership of, like, I, and honestly, like, this is something for me that I had, I've had to do on my own. Like, when we moved here, I didn't, I didn't know anyone, um, and if I, I left my whole family, and if I wanted relationships, I had to build them. I couldn't just depend on those that were there by default, and so I had to, in, to put myself out there and, and, and put myself in relationships, and so, um, so I, I want you just to pray about, have I been a, a, a contributor to my, my loneliness um, because I haven't gone looking for others who might need a friend. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think there are really, there are a ton of reasons why women choose to seclude themselves and isolate themselves and are not open to the opportunity of being vulnerable with each other. One, I think, is this concept of being unfamiliar, especially in these home group settings. It's this, this idea, it's unfamiliar, it's awkward, we're not used to it, it's uncomfortable. But you know what else is uncomfortable? Spanx. And I bet 70% of y'all put them on before you came here today. <laughs> you, you go through the discomfort so you can get the desired result. It's the same thing. You go through the discomfort, you push through it so you can get what you want in the end. Um, I think another reason, even we sang about this in worship, about shame yeah. and how shame will hold you down. Now, I want you to know there's a difference between shame and conviction. Conviction, healthy, good, changes who you are. Shame bogs you down. It keeps you from embracing who God's called you to be. It keeps you from being vulnerable. And a lot of times it might be shame of, I don't want them to know who I used to be. But if we're being honest, for most of us who have been believers for a long time, it's the shame of, I don't want them to see who I am on the inside. I don't want them to see what I struggle with. But then there's, I think this third, there's this third hindrance that keeps us from really embracing this um, intimacy with each other in relationship. And it's this, this concept of past pain. And, you know, none of us are exempt from that. We've all experienced pain at some way, shape, or form in our life. And, and I'm no different. I, um, I remember being really young, and I didn't even share this with you, but I'm going to share it today because I really feel led to. But, you know, my whole life I've always struggled with keeping and retaining friends. And I remember every friend that I ever had, we would get close, we would be really good friends, and then something would happen that I didn't, like, I didn't even see that anything happened, and that friend would drop me every single time. I I remember I had this best friend, and just randomly she stopped talking to me, like, literally I had no idea what was happening, I tried to, like, communicate with her, dropped me. Got another friend, same thing happened. Again, it happened to me over and over and over, and it sort of culminated in this it culminated in this experience that I had when I was 13 years old, and Nisi can attest to this because she was there. I was having a sleepover, and I'd invited like 12 different girls to come and stay the night with me at my Aunt Denise's house, and I was so excited. I couldn't wait for my friends to get there. You know how many people showed up? None. I threw a sleepover, and nobody showed up. And I remember these cheese balls are giving me PTSD because I remember sitting there with Nisi's cheese ball in bed just thinking, what is wrong with me, God? Like, why am I alone? And I really, I, I, in all seriousness, I remember sitting in that bed, ask, like, just asking God, like, what is so wrong with me that when people get to know me, they walk away? And, like, I get it. I'm a lot. I'm probably one of those people that you spend 15 minutes with and you're like, I need a nap. Like, I get that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, like, that rejection ended up causing me to guard my heart in a way that really kept me from embracing other people. And it ended up resulting in broken relationships and friendships, even with leaders in church where I had been used. I was looking so hard for relationships that I was willing to be used just for the relationship. I was willing to do whatever was needed in ministry, even if it wasn't what I was supposed to be doing because I wanted the friendship. I wanted that shoulder to cry on. And then what ended up happening was when situations changed and circumstances changed, I was dropped 
completely. And I felt abandoned and I felt alone. And in that moment, I ended up guarding my heart and shielding my heart. But in doing so, because I didn't want, I didn't want relationships. I knew that relationships had hurt me before. And so I ended up guarding my heart. But in doing that, I ended up exposing it to the enemy to continue to heap to, to continue to heap arrows upon my heart and cre- continue to create damage. And I remember just really quickly, um, once all of this, once my life started to unravel, what I thought were the relationships that I had invested in for so long, I came to iHeart. It was my first time visiting iHeart. Um, I pulled up in the parking lot of the Tamarack and I was sitting in my car and I was like, God, I don't want to be here. I want to go to a church where I can just sit in the back and blend in. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to make eye contact with anybody. I don't want to shake any hands. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm here, and that's all that you're getting from me. Because I had been so damaged, it was almost this uh, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me kind of mentality, and I wasn't going to be vulnerable again. And what happened in my reluctance to be vulnerable and intimate in relationships was this downward spiral and series of unfortunate events that threw me off kilter where I really ran from God in many ways of my life and I struggled and I finally looked in the mirror after years of running, I looked in the mirror and I hated the person that I had become. I was like, this is not the girl that I am. And I remember I I came back to church and I, I, I had been serving the Lord and reading and I remember I was sitting in my bed and I was just like, God, I have no friends. I've never had any friends. Why don't I have any friends? And I was like blaming everybody else. Like, why don't they talk to me at church? Why don't they like come and knock on my door? Why don't they text me? Why don't they check on me? Blaming everybody else. And God just very gently reminded me, you remember what you told me when you were in that parking lot at Our Heart Church your first time there? You didn't want friendship. You didn't want relationship. You wanted to isolate. So stop blaming everybody else and recognize that it is your responsibility to reach out. And at that point, I decided if I'm going to have friends, I got to do it myself. If I'm going to surround myself with covenant relationships, then it's going to be, then it's something I can't blame others for not having them. It's on me. Yeah. And this is a really good point because what I'm not saying to all of you is that we need friends in a codependent way. What I'm not saying is you need somebody to gather around you so that you can get all your emotional needs met from this person. Um, That's a dangerous place to be. What I am saying to you is you need to be the friend that other people need. And so this is going to swing back to the Garden Commission now. We started in the garden. We're going to end here at the garden. Is this commission to go and be fruitful and multiply? It means you reproducing. And so I, the ownership that we each have to take, when Jesus threw a party, it's interesting because Jesus said, when you throw a party, don't invite, invite those who can pay you back. Invite the lame, the crippled, the broken. That's who you invite. And so most of us, we get rejected because we're going after friendships that God maybe has not put in our life. It looks like a good friendship because we can rub up and get clout. And if we're honest, we're using them for because our association with that person makes us seem more important. And so we continue to get wounded. And so I think the better question to say, God, who have you called me to go after that feels like this, that you've called me to bring into my sphere? And so I've decided early on I was going to be the friend that I wish I had. <laughs> like I was going to be the person with, that I wanted to have. And so I would be the better friend. You know, I would be the one initially that would help somebody heal. And what's happened is I've, I've sown into friendships. I've reaped more than I can. I, can, I mean, I've so, I started sowing in being a good friend and I've reaped more than I could have ever sown because it's the law of of, of the harvest and so um, so I'm gonna swing we, and, and keys can go back and come up we're gonna pray for you just a minute but I want to to talk just a minute swinging back to this what does this mean for a rise this means that um, I'm about to cut the pacifier okay so um, I've been slowly cutting it but I'm gonna cut the pacifier now if you're a mom you know what I'm talking about like my baby I love a pacifier in Louisiana we call them a nunu okay I know I stopped calling it that here because everybody was like what's a nunu you know but but so my baby loved at the pacifier and you know a pacifier is really good for a season when a kid really needs a pacifier to self-soothe, but there becomes a time when that pacifier is now stunting, it's messing with their teeth, it's stunting their verbal development. Um, And so to take that pacifier, a trick of, a mommy trick, for those of you here on the stage, is to first you just puncture a little hole in it so it collapses and it doesn't have that suction. And then if they still don't get it, then you just slip the, you snip the tip off the end of it, and then they get no satisfaction. They stop using it. So they're like, meh. <laughs> you know, like they, don't, they don't like it. Okay, so remember I told you that I don't want to be a teacher. I want to be a mother. I want to see you grow into maturity and to see you be empowered. So this is the vision for what Arise is going to look like this year. Um, all of that set up to say this. Um, 
each month we will start actually pre-recording Arise messages and worship to have available at the beginning of the month, starting next month. So you can do your Arise gathering at any point in time um, that you want to in the month. It doesn't have, I do recommend highly that it's the same night each month so that the girls in your community that you're inviting um, would have consistency. And so pray about it and invite those girls. We will still have this in this setting. Sometimes it'll be video. Sometimes I might just decide to teach it again live. Um, but this setting, I really only envision we're still going to have discussion. We're still going to bring, maybe I'll bring some snacks to share with one another to try to create breaking bread. But I envision this really only for people who don't have a place to go for home gathering. So scripture talks about the foreigners that don't have, that don't know anybody or for babes in Christ that maybe they're new to the faith and they just don't have community. This is that colony that helps catch them and connect people. Um, and also for if you're a co-host or a host, if you're opening your home and you need ministry still, you're doing this broken, um, which I know many of you, I applaud you that you're not waiting until you're completely sanctified, because if that was the case, I wouldn't be doing this either. Um, and you still want ministry. So this would be for co-hosts and hosts. If you're not meeting on Arise Gathering Night, that you could come here and the pastors and staff that will help minister with you and, and pray for you. And so this would be really as a catch place, but not the primary. We want you in homes. And even for those of you here tonight, you're welcome to still come here, especially, again, if you need that passy, you're still in a, an appropriate stage for that passy, come. Or if you're a co-host or a host that wants wants ministry as you minister. And so you're going to do yours on a different night so you can be here and be ministered to by the pastors and staff. Then come. Um, but invite someone in your sphere. I'm asking you to take the commission of Genesis seriously. To take Jesus' commission to all disciples to go and multiply. To take the seed of God that's in you and start looking for women that are in your world. Not women that already go to church, but women that are in your world. Take Jesus up on his word. He said... Find the lost, the broken, the ones that nobody wants, the outcasts, that blessed are you if you invite those into your home that can't repay you, that you're not getting anything out of this relationship. And so I encourage you, even if it's just two, even if it's just three. And so I've just got, I'm not going to be able to go into this long, but I want to look at how God solved the Genesis problem of it's not good. First he put Adam to sleep, and then he cut out his stomach and took a rib, and then he gave the rib to someone else. And this is how God solves loneliness still now is that one, we have to let God put us to sleep. And this is all these questions that are going through your head now. What if they reject me? What if my house is not clean? What if, you know, what if nobody comes? What if, you know, I'm not good at this? What if I say something dumb? I don't know how to pray. All of those things, just take a deep breath. And just let God put, that to, put you to sleep for just a moment. Just trust him that he knows what he's doing. He wants to empower his girl to be his ambassador. And then let God access your most vulnerable places. The ribs is something that we guard. You know, it's right here. You have to lift your arm up to have access to that. And so in these groups, God's going to ask you some, for some vulnerable parts of you to share, to share a story, to share even at your table discussion as we get ready to talk. He's going to ask you to take something out. Maybe some of you have been watching just by yourself in a home right now. Some of, somebody's watching right now. You knew you were supposed to go to somebody's house and you wanted to stay in your PJs and not go. And the Lord's saying, will you just let me have your vulnerable place? I know you messed up this week. And it's okay. You don't have to confess all that in your group, but just go. Just keep showing up. Just keep go. Keep connect. Give someone else. And that's the last thing is let God use what's in you to bring life to another. God took Adam's most vulnerable thing and he gave it to Eve and it created life. And what's in you, God has already put. How do we win the world? We invade it. What's in you is already there to reproduce spiritual life. Your story, your shame, your past, your mess. God wants to use all good and bad of you to reach and to make new life for someone else. But you have to stop fighting and arguing and rationalizing and bargaining with God. Go, Just rest, surrender to him. Let him take your vulnerable spots and give it to someone else to bring life. Amen. Why don't you close your eyes? Kayla, will you pray for all the ladies? And I just thank you guys for allowing me to, to push you out the nest. I'm telling you, this is where there's true life and revival. You want to pray? Father, we just come before you this evening. We're so thankful for who you are. 
for what you do in our lives, God, that when we allow the vulnerable parts of us to be exposed to you and to your will, God, that you take and you mend and you restore. God, you are a God who brings restoration where there has been brokenness. And I know that there are people in this room, even this evening, God, who feel broken, who feel like they have been knocked off the shelf and that they have not been put back together. But God, I pray that they would allow you to heal and restore and put the broken pieces of their lives back together. God, and that you would bring restoration in their life, God. And that they would allow you to do that, that they would be obedient, that they would heed your word, God. And I know that there are girls in this room and girls watching at home, God, who they, when, when Melody was talking about who are the people in your life who need to hear this, they knew a name. There was a name in their heart that they needed to go and reach out to, God. I pray that you would give them courage and boldness to be the friend who will wake up at midnight and go and rescue their friend, God. Who won't be afraid of being told no, who won't be afraid of rejection, but will be vulnerable and willing to do whatever it takes to build your kingdom, God that we would be kingdom minded, that we would stay focused on the mission that you have placed in our hearts, God, that we would understand that the vision you have for us is not to hurt us, it's not to damage us, it's not to, it's not to bring pain to our life, but it's literally to bring healing and it's to bring restoration, and it's to bring life to the broken places of who we are, God. I pray that you would shine your light on those areas and that we would begin to see what you see when when you look at us, God. And I just pray that as we as we implement this new vision for Arise, this vision that you have for Arise, God, that we wouldn't fight it, that we wouldn't be reluctant to follow, that we wouldn't say, this isn't what I want, so I'm not gonna do it, but that we would lean in. We would go past the discomfort, God, even in discomfort, it's, it's almost always out of discomfort and out of pain that beauty comes, Lord. Even when new life is brought in, into this world, God, it is through a series of painful events that new life is brought, God. And I pray that even as this is painful, even it is uncomfortable, even as it is, is not what we are used to, that we would listen and that we would obey because it is, it's, it's when we obey that you multiply, God. I just thank you so much that that you love your daughters enough to speak to them. Lord, I just pray that even as they are wondering whether or not they should open their home for that one friend, God, that you would just begin to confirm in their life that they should, that God, I just love that even in your ministry on earth, you spent most of your ministry in homes. It was in homes that you healed. It was in homes that you restored. It was in homes that you brought forgiveness and healing. And I just know that it's in the homes of your daughters that you're gonna do that exact same thing today. If you did it, then you're gonna do it now. God, I just thank you for what you're gonna do in the lives of your daughters. In Jesus' name. Hey ladies, we hope that you have enjoyed this evening's message. We hope that you have allowed the Lord to speak to your heart, that he has showed you some new things that you can take with you as you go throughout the rest of your week. Um, if you haven't already downloaded the discussion questions, make sure you go to the website and grab those because we don't want you to miss out on any aspect of our Arise gatherings and discussing the message and evaluating the message and realizing how you can use that in your life is so vital to get the most out of what the Lord is wanting to speak to you this evening. Now, if at any point during this evening, you began to feel a little bit convicted that maybe you wanna host a home gathering for some of your friends, I want you to reach out to me. Even if you're not sure you really wanna do it, but you have just an inkling of a desire and you just want more information, then please email me at Kayla at AriseWomensConference.com and I am happy to give you any of the resources you need to make your home gathering a success. We wanna talk with you. We wanna to continue to grow our relationships with each other just as God has commanded us. And the best way to do that is to continue to place an emphasis on the home gatherings where we can lean on each other, grow with each other, and hold each other accountable. So again, email me at Kayla at AriseWomensConference.com for more information. Now, on that same note, we are so excited because this summer we are gonna have our very first Arise Women's Conference conference 
Hostess and Co-Hostess Weekend where we are going to spend the weekend just spoiling you and investing in you. We want you to have a weekend of rest, a, a weekend where you can come and be restored, receive prayer and healing. And so make sure if you haven't already registered for our Hostess Weekend that you, that you go ahead and register. We don't want you to miss out on any of the important updates. We don't want you to miss this important weekend because it is gonna be full of blessings from the Lord for those of you who are walking in this calling and building the kingdom by hosting a Rise Home Gathering. So if the Lord has showed you something amazing this evening, or if he's done something amazing in your life, we wanna hear about that. We wanna hear your testimonies. Scripture tells us that we are healed by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies, and we want you to share your testimonies with us. Email us at amen at arisewomensconference.com so that we can rejoice with you, so that we can pray with you, because we love you and we are so excited about what God is gonna continue to do in the hearts of his daughters as we continue to invest in our relationships with him. I'm free. 
just want to stand it up and pour my love on you no matter how much the cost I freely give it all to you all to you I just want to move you I just want to move you get caught within your gaze Caught within your gaze, right here in your presence, God, is where I want to stay, hold oh, just to dwell in your house, waste my hours and my days on
Things were good. 